Let's talk relationships and energy management with my friend Emily today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Evolve with Emily show. I'm your host, Emily Hayden, and today's episode is going to broaden your perspective on what it means to live a fulfilling life. So without further ado, Craig Ballantyne, welcome to today's show. I'm truly so honored to have you here today. Oh, thank you so much, Emily. This is going to be a lot of fun. I think so, too. So I was personally incredibly impacted by your second book, which was The Perfect Day Formula, so much so that my podcast listeners know that I've actually done a few episodes sharing some of your strategies and telling them all to go get the book yesterday and implement it into oh, their life. Cool. Yeah, it was just really impactful. So when I found out that you had The Perfect Week Formula, I was really excited to dive in today. One of the most impactful things that I think I've recognized in my life is the ability to actually see how other people live their lives because I find that either it will show you exactly what you don't want or it broadens your perspective to say, I never thought about doing it like that. So where I want to start today's show is could you share with us what a day in your life looks like? What is your daily routine? Absolutely. So I don't use an alarm, but I get up anywhere uh, from about quarter to four to 4.30. So today, our daughter, um, sh she's nine months old, and she's she was sleeping through the night, and now she's kind of getting back up in the middle of the night. So she got up around quarter to four, which is actually perfect timing um, because – that's the time of day I like to get up. So I actually, I'm uh, as, as daddy, I'm on middle of the night feeding duties. So my wife puts her to bed and endures the kind of crying and screaming mm -hmm. to put her to sleep every night. And then if she wakes up, I mean, some, we go to bed really early. So we go to bed, like baby goes to bed at six thirty, seven o'clock. We go to bed about eight o'clock. And sometimes the baby wakes up at nine 30. <laughs> That's not the fun oh, one, but yeah. But last last night was great. So she woke mm -hmm. up at about quarter to four. I went in there. I gave her a couple ounces, and she fell right back to sleep again. And then I went down, and I, I started work. So the the general schedule is four till six is my alone time. I think. I write. I go through contracts. You know, I was going through an investment contract the other day. You know, stuff that's really hard. I do the hardest thing first. Mm -hmm. And as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's easier for me to do the harder things first than it is for me to do a hard thing at this time of day, which is three o'clock. Um, there's no way I could read that contract at this time of day. So then after that, six o'clock till eight o'clock in the morning is family time. So hopefully you can't hear in the background, but my dog is drinking a, a bowl of water. But uh, <laughs> during the six from six, so it sounds really weird, but 6 a.m. till 8 a.m., baby gets up, we feed her. So she's eating solid foods now. So we have a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then seven o'clock to eight o'clock, our family goes for a walk. We live in Cancun, Mexico. And so we live oh. in this area. Yeah, we live in this gated community near the airport. You fly over me when you're coming into Cancun. So whenever anybody's coming down for vacation, just wave. wave. The <laughs> yeah, you, you'll see me uh, just uh, outside of the jungle. And we go for a walk. Dog goes for a swim. We get back about eight o'clock in the morning, and then I go into my second work block, which is usually from about eight until 11. And you'll find that my day is just really broken up. After, it's like work block, then break up, work up block, then break up. And so it's, it looks like it's a long day, but it's actually about eight hours of work. And so from eight till 11, I really focus on revenue generating activities, on cranking out some copies, some sales letters, helping other people on my team with their sales approaches, maybe some role play sales calls or whatever. And then 11 o'clock, I go work out. At 12 o'clock, I have lunch. And then at 1 o'clock until 4 o'clock, usually, I have another work block. And that's where I do all of this outward-facing type stuff, calls, whether it's with a coaching client or whether it's with uh, you know, a podcast like this. Mm -hmm. After this, I'm going to catch up with uh, another CEO and just you know, see how he's doing and you know, see what's working in his business. And so that gen generally gets me to about 4 o'clock. And then from four until eight, it's back to family time. So that's kind of like my little rotation. And I'm a big believer in time blocks. So mm -hmm. I'd rather have a single three hour work block per week on a project than three one hour work blocks on a project. Because if you do the three by one hour or six by 30 minute, you die a death of a thousand cuts through transition time. Mm -hmm. Now, I will, I would just add one more thing there, Emily, is that once upon a time, I was a broke, struggling personal trainer who could only work in sometimes 10-minute blocks. 
I mean, I wrote articles for Men's Health Magazine while standing in a cramped subway car on an old Blackberry for a long time because that's the only time I could do it. Wow. And there's a really famous uh, female short story author named Alice Munro who actually won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. And she wrote most of her best-selling books when she was a single mother of three who worked in the bookstore below her apartment. And she worked in what she called the slivers of time, which was when the kids were off to school before she had to go to work. So there's time when you kind of have to muscle through mm -hmm. and work in the slivers of time. But when you get to the point where you control your own time as much as you can, you need to work in big blocks of time because that's mm -hmm. where you'll have your huge breakthroughs. I remember reading your book that time and energy management combined was a new concept at that point for me. Whereas before in college, we did some time management courses, but it was quite literally just manage your time and put something in each time block. Whereas what I learned from you was like really assessing when do I have the best energy for different tasks. So like you were mentioning, you wouldn't be able to look through that contract at 3 p.m. So I think that self-awareness is really important just to be very aware of like when you have your best ability to work on certain things. Like a little visual that's really helpful for everybody is, you know, whether you've had kids or not, you've seen the toy where it's there's a square hole and the, the child is supposed to take square block and put in square hole. Mm -hmm. And what most people do in their lives is they take a round peg and try and jam it in a square hole mm -hmm. all day long in terms of their energy management. So they are doing that hard thing at two o'clock and maybe they just had a work meeting and, you know, we all know we shouldn't eat a, you know, a lot of simple carbs at lunchtime. But maybe they did have some simple carbs at lunchtime. They're falling asleep in their chair at 2 o'clock, and they're supposed to be reading that contract that, oh, gosh darn, they really should have read first thing in the morning. But, you know, distraction, social media, email got them down the rabbit hole first thing in the morning. So they burnt that time, and now they're trying to, uh, you know, to jam the square peg in the round hole at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so what you need to do is identify the time of day when you have the greatest energy, focus, creativity, and discipline and do the hardest thing at that time. For most people, it naturally is earlier in the day. Because as the day goes on, you get a whole bunch of emails, you get all your coworkers, your team members, or you know whoever is involved in your life bringing to you their emergencies, the kids get sick, you gotta run there, this, that, and the other thing. And the next thing you know, trying to do something in the afternoon becomes impossible. And so uh, take that most difficult task that requires your greatest energy intensity and focus and put it in the time of day when you have the greatest discipline willpower and intention which again is often early in the day mm -hmm. and when you match those things up that's when you can get more done in less time what about for those people that say i'm just not a morning person i can't wake up early yeah it's, it's a great question and, and so um now that i live in cancun i'm uh, i want to learn how to speak spanish and I've been doing it on my own for about a year. And today I had my first lesson with a tutor and he actually, you know, we were, we were trying to do, uh, talk about this in, and I was trying to uh, explain to him that uh, yo escribi un libro uh, sobre uh, Tiempo? Uh, man, uh, routine, routine, oh. routine de la mañana. So it's like talking about the, the morning routine. He goes, oh, yeah, my girlfriend's like that. And he's speaking in English at this uh -huh. point. He goes, my girlfriend, you know, she gets up and she goes right to it. But, you know, for me, it takes me like 20 minutes to even acknowledge like my body is alive. And, right. and we were talking about that. And, and listen, I totally understand people that are like that. And I also um, I want people to understand that my practice, my principles, my foundational principles are not important about it's not important about exact hour that you get up mm. it's about what you, you do with the hours that you are up and so i had a very good friend of mine who built a hundred million dollar business working between 10 p.m and 4 a.m and sometimes i'd work at his house and so when i got up at four o'clock in the morning that was his signal to go to bed oh my but gosh he used, he used the same principles mm -hmm. that at 10 o'clock at night he attacked the hardest thing and so it doesn't matter what time you get up. It doesn't matter if it does take you an hour for your brain because you, that's just your body, right? It's your mm -hmm. body. It's your body, mind-body connection that it takes you longer than people like me. I, I, could, I, I could be at work in seven minutes, like from the moment I get up. Right. I can just crank stuff out. Don't worry about me. Instead, again, go back to where is your greatest intensity of um, – mental intensity, energy, focus, creativity, and make that time 
your time. Do not allow other people into it. Do not, do not allow other activities into it. Do not mm-hmm. waste it on the distractions. You, wh- when you know that, it's usually about 90 minutes to two hours. And you can get like eight hours, of, you know, quote unquote, eight hours of productivity in that two hours, you know, if you compared to if you tried to do it another time of day. So those people that wake up slow, listen, it might be, in, it might be two hours after you get up, but that's when you got to attack it. So self-reflection and introspection is absolutely critical Mm -hmm. for this time management and energy stuff. And then I know what other people are thinking, well, I'm on somebody else's schedule. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe they're high up in a company or maybe they're kind of doing a side hustle and they got to work all day long. You may not get it every day. And so if you can get it, if you can rearrange a meeting schedule mm-hmm. or, you know, if it has to be Saturday only, that's the only day you get for right now. Because mm-hmm. I was a personal trainer who trained, you know, I'm a morning person and I was a personal trainer in, you know, when I was younger and it was six days a week from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. And you know what? OK, great. Well, actually, it was, it was five days a week from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. And then on Saturday from 8 till 11 a.m. And then Sunday, no. And so it's like, okay, the only two days I get my magic time is what I call that time of day is on Saturday and Sunday. And that's what I'm going to do until I make enough money that I'm able to sacrifice guaranteed income for future income by not taking clients on Thursday morning at six Mm o'clock. And that was the evolution that I did to kind of take back control of my time. I think what I'm hearing is kind of assess where you're at and seek to optimize wherever you're at in your journey. So even if it's one day of magic time, know that you want to get to do, doing that every day, which is the beauty of, you know, when you're creating your own life and business, you can actually create your life and business to be congruent together versus them always opposing each other. So you spoke a little bit um, on how important it is that when you identify this magic time to not allow anything to come into that. So that's kind of where I want to go next is the idea of creating boundaries and non-negotiables. And how does this create more freedom in somebody's life? Because I think a lot of people hear boundaries and they think constriction, but in reality, they are to give freedom. So what are your thoughts on creating boundaries, non-negotiables, and how does that create freedom in, in one's life? Yeah, so I'll use a bit of a personal example that is not necessarily work-related, and then you can kind of dig deeper into the, the, the maybe a work-related side of it. But mm-hmm. So if you go back in time to when I was a single guy, and I had really nothing on my calendar. So I had this wide-open calendar. There was no boundaries on it. And if anybody here is a you know a single entrepreneur and who does kind of control their own time, online entrepreneur, you can look at your calendar and you can fill it with work. Like, there's mm-hmm. when there's no boundaries and there's a vacuum, it's like, okay, it's Tuesday. None of my friends are doing anything interesting. It's five o'clock. I've really got all my work done for the day, but you know, I, you know, I'm going to have dinner in maybe an hour or two. I guess I can work another couple hours. And so there's no boundary there. Mm-hmm. And that actually puts you into a bit of a prison. And that, um, I wrote a book about how I had this really bad anxiety attack. And when I was younger, because I was working all the time with no boundaries on my work. And when I put boundaries on my work, it then made me more effective. So I said, you know, I'm I'm done work by five o'clock every single day. I didn't need to work more hours. I just didn't have any boundaries on it. And I ended up overworking myself, getting burnt out, you know, having the anxiety attacks. So now what I do in my life is uh, when I walked through that plan before, there was hard boundaries, hard boundary at six, hard boundary at eight, hard boundary at 11, hard boundary at, at one or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually it's it's one o'clock uh, to four and then hard boundary from four to eight and hard boundary for the bedtime too. And those boundaries, those hard boundaries, it sounds like, oh, there's no spontaneity in that. Well, there is a ton of spontaneity within each of uh, the family time free boundaries. And because I have those boundaries and it forces me to be very productive, I actually work way less and make more money and have all weekend off to be spontaneous with my family. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of boundaries compared to the power of, you know, this free, I can do anything whenever I want, wherever I want. It actually, it ends up being a paradox, this paradox of freedom that puts you in this prison of you, um, you might tend to overwork or, or that sort of thing. Or it's the same with, with exercise, if you said, listen, I've only got three hours per week and I'm, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to get in great shape. Well, that's, that's 
in many cases better than if like I got six hours, so I'm gonna do all this training. I'm gonna end up with these overuse injuries, and I'm mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do a lot of training that's not even very effective mm -hmm. because eventually you get to the point where there's a law of diminishing returns, mm -hmm. and so that's that's what it is when it comes down to your boundaries. And I've always believed, even before I had a child myself, that when an entrepreneur um, had their first kid. It either goes one of two directions. One, they just become so chaotic and they blame everything and, and they make excuses, right? Or they just go, oh, I finally realized what's really important. And now I want to have more time with my child. So I'm going to put hard boundaries in. I'm going to mm -hmm. cut all this stuff that doesn't you know, make any meaningful improvement. And it's the boundaries that help you identify what really matters so that you can choose the right activities and get the same or more results in less time. Wow, that's impactful. And I love that you bring up your experience of when you were a single guy. I was actually having a conversation with a friend who's a single guy, very successful, has a great job. And he was just sharing how he works 24 seven and he yeah. eventually would like to be married, eventually would like children, but he's like, well, I have nothing else to do, so I might as well work. What is maybe like a mindset shift that you could give him in, in, yeah, like what would be his reason for not choosing to work at night when he's technically at home alone? Right. So, so, so something has to go on the calendar, right? Because if we don't have something on the calendar, it is this vacuum. And, you know, it could be somebody who's listening to this. I just fill that vacuum with Netflix or I fill that vacuum with television or I fill that vacuum scrolling Instagram. We've all mm -hmm. filled a vacuum with Instagram before. 100%. And, you know, that, <laughs> I mean, somebody said, no, I can't wait till they invent a time machine. They have invented a time machine and it's Instagram, only it's not a very good. Oh, my gosh, it's <laughs> true. So so, you know, we go to our friend and we say, listen, mm -hmm. it, it, if you state this is what you want, what you need to do is align your actions and your goals. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that is you have to put your butt where your heart needs it to be. And so you have to schedule you know, because you could work from, you know, Monday, Tuesday, you got all these meetings and stuff. You can work till nine o'clock in the office, whatever. That's not going to get you ahead in life. And it's actually, you know, you're going to blink and you're going to be 37 years old. And, you know, this is a very unfair fact about life is you can be in, like, I didn't get married till I was 44, right? And mm -hmm. so most, most women can't get married at 44 and have babies, but I was able to do it. So it's not fair. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm just saying, but mm -hmm. even to your friend, he, he doesn't want to blink and, you know, next thing you know, he's 37, 38, 39, 40, and, and hasn't gotten anywhere with his goals. So he needs to put stuff on the calendar because those will act as real boundaries and it could be like he's going to join Ultimate Frisbee or he's mm -hmm. going to go and he's going to join this thing. He's going to join this other thing. He's going to he's going to do blind dates, whatever he's going to do. Mm -hmm. He's got to put that stuff on the calendar because that then creates the boundary. And the whole the whole perfect week book that you have um, read mm -hmm. came out of this experience that I had with a very successful entrepreneur, a guy named Bedros Koulian, mm -hmm. who at you know, I've, I've known the guy for, for 12 years now, and we ran a coaching program together. And I, I would I lived in Toronto, and he lived in California, and I'd fly down there to California, and we'd do these two days of coaching that would end on a Wednesday, and it didn't matter. Wednesday, 5 o'clock, I've flown all the way down from Canada. We've had two great days of work. You think, like, okay, the, the boys are going to go out and, and, you know, have dinner. He's like, okay, buddy, you're on your own. It's date night tonight. It, every Wednesday, five o'clock, it's date night. This is a guy who had 60 employees. He has a fitness franchise with 500 franchisees throughout North America. Busy as heck. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a non-negotiable. 5 p.m., date night, it's on the calendar. Now, if you know that, what do you think his Wednesday looks like? Do you think it involves a lot of scrolling on Instagram? Do you think it'll, you know, no, it doesn't involve any of that wasted time because it's, he's forced to be focused so that at five o'clock at night, he can go home, get ready, pick up his wife, and they can go out and have an important evening. Mm -hmm. And that is the same mentality that your, you know, your single friend needs to take. Mm -hmm. And the person out there who's like, oh man, I really wish I could you know, work out more, but I work a lot. And you know, no, you just gotta put the workouts on the calendar as non-negotiables mm -hmm. as, you know, same as like when you put a dentist visit on your calendar, you work around it, you make time for that thing. And if I was to leave everybody just with, you know, if they learn nothing else from this podcast is 
to take the phrase, I'm trying to find time to blank and change the word find to, well, not, I'm tr change the word trying to, I'm going to, mm -hmm. and find to make. Mm -hmm. Because you don't find time for anything. It's not hidden under the bed <laughs> with the ab rocker you bought 20 years ago. Right. You, you only make time. Mm -hmm. You make time for what matters. And if you're finding that you're not finding time, like if you look at yourself and you man, for the last three years, I said I was going to try and find time to learn Spanish or mm -hmm. do this, that. It, it's just not that important to you, and you should just let it go. <laughs> That's and a good point. Because if something's, yeah, if something's important to you, you're going to make time for it. So switch that and just go, man, if this relationship is important, I'm going to make time for it. This goal of mine is important. I'm going to make time for it. I'm not, I'm not ever going to try and find time for something that's important because you never will. In your book, you talk a lot about getting rid of distractions. And especially when you do have, for example, that family time, you talk about like literally putting your phone down and actually being present with your family and having worked with multiple, you know, big time entrepreneur men, have you, and, and I'm kind of bringing this from a woman's perspective, right? Because I have a lot of women listeners on the podcast. Let's say that one of them is really desiring more undistracted time with their partner who is a high level CEO. He owns his own business. And so far, the pattern of their relationship has been that they have been so understanding that they're so busy and so many people need them all the time that they've allowed a pattern of constant checking the phone, constant texting or emails at dinner. How could this partner, how could this woman bring up in conversation in a way that would hopefully be received by this, you know, entrepreneur, or business owner? How could they bring up in conversation that they would like more undistracted time while being conscientious of the fact that they do have a lot on their plate? Do you have any tips for that? The first tip is that you must lead by example. And I love this. Um, one of my friends who was a parent told me that your, your kids' behaviors are caught not taught. So if you want your spouse, your partner, your kids to put their phone away and be present, and we'll just, we'll just start with that general uh, mm -hmm. approach, then you must never be mm -hmm. on your phone while you're talking to somebody. So it starts with like, okay, so let's lead by example here. Great. Then what you need to do is, there's a couple ways of doing it. One is like, can you give me, can we start with just five minutes? The way that I have always thought about this is when I was a young personal trainer, I knew a lot of women who did six, nine hours of cardio, Re regular women, not women like getting ready for a fitness competition, you know, on, the, on uh, you know, three weeks out. But mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking like, and, and we, I, we, I knew, I knew logically, and they maybe knew that they didn't need to do six hours. And so I wouldn't say, well, let's just go down to like zero mm -hmm. because, you know, that's like taking crack away from a crack addict, right? right. You can't do that. But, right. but it's like, hey, listen, we're going to cut it down by 30 minutes and we're going to see that your results aren't going to change. And so what I'm looking for here is that if we start with five minutes and he sees like nothing happened in five minutes, great. Now we can expand upon that in the other way. Whereas before we were like cutting back, now we're expanding upon it. Or I guess you could say, like, instead of you being with your phone 24 hours a day, you can be without your phone. So I do a lot of rational arguing, and so I'm not, <laughs> okay. uh, I'm not, I'm not always going to give a great answer, but the, the best answer in this. But, you know, so everybody sleeps, right? Mm -hmm. And you were without your phone because I use this rational argument when I'm getting people to not look at their phone first thing in the morning. Uh -huh. Everybody's been asleep for at least six hours, right? Mm -hmm. And so you are away from your phone for six hours. So can you just give me another five minutes? Can you give me another 10 minutes? Can you give me, like, can we take that six hours up to eight hours, eight hours to 10 hours, and so on and so forth? Because when I had my anxiety attacks, when I was younger, I woke up and I would check the phone, like rolled over right on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, something negative, you know, there'd be 30 positive messages, one negative message, and, you know, my morning would be ruined. Mm -hmm. So I realized that was a huge problem and I decided that I was going to wake up five minutes earlier and check my phone five minutes later. So I had a 10-minute spread. And I didn't do that every single day and try and add five minutes. No, it was, it was a full week of just a 10-minute spread. And then the week after that, I added five minutes on each side and I had a 20-minute spread. And the next thing you know, there was a point where I was getting up at 5.30 in the morning because um, I started at 7.30 uh, mm -hmm. when I had my anxiety. I got it back to 5.30 in the morning and I wasn't checking my phone until 9.30. So I had this four-hour block. So what you're going to look for is having, first of all, just like a little bit of time 
and then expanding upon it, mm -hmm. I think is one approach to doing it. Um, yeah, I think, other thing I think that's very practical and very helpful and an easy way for people to come together because I can't really imagine a partner saying no to five minutes of undistracted time. And I feel like if you can get that yes and you guys are both fully present in those moments and then let them have their phone again when the five minutes is up, then uh, it would be pretty easy maybe next time to ask for 10. So that's the rational way of doing it. Okay. Now, let me tell you what I've seen work uh, for myself, right? Because okay. I myself have been guilty of this. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is clearly the emotional uh, appeal. You know, the, seeing the hurt in somebody's eyes when you're on your phone and, and you know, you're at a, a restaurant and you're on your mm -hmm. phone and you're both not Instagramming what you're eating because my, my wife and I do this, right? right. <laughs> but, but we're not checking messages between and that sort of stuff. But there was a time where I may have, you know, been on my phone when we were having coffee or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you look up and they're disappointed. And honestly, like the whole rational thing, yeah, it could work. But nothing, nothing would make me change more than that. Oh, and wow. my, um, one of the people on my team, the head coach in our coaching program, his, it was his daughter that, that um, you know, she's four years old, and she looked up, and she just said, why are you on your phone all the time, Daddy? Like, they were on the couch. They were supposed to be having quality time. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like, and he just like, man, it was like getting stabbed in the heart. Oh, my and gosh. So, yeah, and, and so, like, honestly, at the end of the day, uh, I, I don't want people to start, I don't want, I don't want to say this because it's like, oh, my gosh, what if this goes wrong and people <laughs> get in fights? But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, the real, the real answer is like for, you know, man or woman to mm -hmm. sit there and go, listen, I love you, but mm -hmm. I just feel like neglected when you are and ignored and, and I'm hurt mm -hmm. by the fact that you're on your phone while we're supposed to be doing X, Y, Z, what was supposed to be helping our kids with their homework or what was supposed to be helping. Like, yeah, you can then say, well, listen, you know, the five minutes today, six minutes next time, right, like right. that's a rational way of doing it. But man, I don't know if anything's really going to be better than than having that real adult conversation about this is just not fair to me. Like, yeah, this is just not cool. Absolutely. And I think just honestly expressing your needs and maybe starting with the need is coming from the fact that I love you and I really desire to have deeper connection with you that's undistracted. Do you think, you know, this could happen? So I love your perspective on that. I always like to ask, like, I'll, I'll, I'll say, yeah, yeah go I'll ahead. say one more thing. I, I sort of interrupt. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's very important to set the expectations. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to set the expectation about anything. You know, mm -hmm. you and I were like setting the expectation about the length of the podcast just before we started recording, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, and, and the, again, this kind of goes back to if you're on your phone while you're doing stuff and talking to your spouse and then you get upset with them because they're on their phone, like they're going to, they're going to be like, Whoa, what's going on here? Like uh, yeah. this doesn't, cause you don't expect the same in reverse. But mm -hmm. if, if you say, Hey, listen, we're going to go, out. I'm really, really looking forward to this dinner tonight. You know, we're going out and you know, it's date night or whatever, whatever you call it, or, you know, we're just going to go to the movies or whatever. I'm really looking forward to this quality time with you. I'm so excited. I'm going to leave my phone at home. Like I leave my phone at home now on, on our date nights as much as possible mm -hmm. because I just don't want the temptation mm -hmm. and it's just so much easier. Now, usually one person needs to have their phone, but right. um, just setting the expectation, I would, you know, I would love us to not use our phones tonight as mm -hmm. much as possible. And then you stick to that commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll be another way of preemptively uh, avoiding the guilt look or the, mm -hmm. any arguments or something that comes up. It's just like, you know, this night is, I really want it to be about us and conversation and experience and that sort of stuff. And, you know, it, it is difficult because you just, sometimes you just want to capture the moment and it's your phone and yep. then the dang phone is, you know, may have notifications on mm -hmm. it or something or may pop up. And, and once you open that, one message again you enter the time machine of the phone <laughs> it's and it, you know it's it's a real hand grenade sometimes so you know you get you have it turned off in airplane mode and stuff like that or you know you simply get a burner phone that's camera only maybe you know sometimes i mean i i have i have some clients with multiple phones that it's just like i just have to have uh, another phone for being around family where there's nothing on it or for whatever because or they have a, a work phone where there's nothing on it except for their phone number. Be, because if um, 
I don't, even, I don't even know where my phone is. That's like when you that's get awesome. to the point where you don't know your phone is, that's when you're winning. Yeah. But because going back to like the entire topic of distractions, mm -hmm. my visualization is to build a fence around yourself, to build a fence around yourself that keeps the wolves out, the time stealers mm -hmm. out. And so you have to have these systems in place with your phone because if you, if you take a look at what the actual phone, so the phone is full of things mm -hmm. built by some of the smartest people in the world. We've, we've sent our smartest minds to California to mm -hmm. build little tools that make us addicted to our phone. That is unfortunate, but that's the reality. And if you think that you and your discipline are going to wake up every single morning without any systems and strategies and have your discipline beat the addictive power of you know, 10,000 PhDs from MIT who are out there trying to make you addicted to your phone, you're never going to win that battle. So good. And so you, so, so the question is, how do you build a fence around yourself? Mm -hmm. How do you build these systems that prevent you from getting sucked into the time machine of the phone? And for me, like, Hey, listen, I'm human. I will get sucked into that time machine too at times. And it's phone is in airplane mode. Phone is physically mm -hmm. turned off physically is in another room and it is in a desk drawer mm -hmm. and i know that's like that's ridiculous and like listen if i could like you know have a shark protecting the <laughs> phone from me i would do that too. that's awesome that one yet. <laughs> but you know i would i want all those levels because there's been days where i've gotten to the point where i've turned it on and i'm like what am i doing and it's but fortunately there was four levels and so by the time i got to the third level i was able to like swap my hand put it back mm -hmm and go back to work because dang, those things are addictive mm -hmm. and we need to figure out, you know, how to build a fence around ourselves, how to help others build a fence around themselves and the phone, how to communicate the expectations of the event that we're going to and mm -hmm. what the, you know, expectations of behavior are going to be, what the definition of success is, you know, it, it'll be a wonderful date night tonight. If we can both stay off our phones, uh, that, mm -hmm. that would make tonight a magical night. If that's set in advance, then now we know here's the objective. Mm -hmm. But if we're just like, hey, meet you at, you know, Mastro's tonight for dinner at seven o'clock. I know you're coming straight from work. I'll see you there. And there's no expectations. There's no, mm -hmm. hey, leave your phone in the car. There's no like, let's leave work behind. But just I'll see you after work. Like he's going to be in work m mindset. He's going to come in there. He's going to have he's going to be on his phone. He's going to sit down. The phone's going to be buzzing. And. There was never any rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. So when we have that clearly communicated, we're able to switch from, you know, the work person to the, you know, the, the, to the husband or to the boyfriend mm -hmm. or to, to whatever it is. And, and so that's key. And that ability to switch, I've talked to mostly male entrepreneurs. I'll mm -hmm. be honest. There's some, some women that I talk to, but mostly male. And those that work outside of the home, and then go home and the young kids greet them at the door. I teach them this little, like you got, it's hard to shut off for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I teach them how to shut off. And it's like, Hey, listen, remember that last time, last summer you went to six flags and it was the greatest time and you're driving home a smile on your face. And that, you know, maybe it was like a kid rock, just picking kid rock here. I'm yeah. not saying anything about kid rock, but, you know, kid rock song came on. It's just like, you were just having the time of your life. Play that song on the drive home from work. If you have to, if you have to sit in the driveway and play it six times to settle down after a tough day, sit there and listen to that song. Because when you go inside that house, you have to be world's number one dad. And I don't care how much work kicked you in the stomach mm -hmm. today, you, you know? And so it's that mindset. And, you know, same with when that man's leaving and going to the date night with his wife, listen to the song, put, you know, turn the phone off, listen to the song that you got married to or whatever, first mm -hmm. date, whatever. Get yourself in the mindset mm -hmm. so that when you show up to the engagement, you know, to the event, you are in the right mindset for that. Because in this day and age, we switch roles a lot during the day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need a little anchors like that. Yeah, I think that is such an amazing tool to use because it's it's hard not to carry work into life, especially when, you know, you have your own business and a lot of your work is your life, you know, especially for people who do social media, they're used to documenting everything. It is hard to create those clear boundaries. So I, I love your 
your, your advice here to create those boundaries, have those expectations, the upfront conversations. The only reason I can give advice on any of this stuff is because I've had to figure it right. out for myself. Yeah. <laughs> I had every problem that you could possibly imagine, and I have built a system uh, to overcome it. And I, I love that. That's the best kind of advice is when it comes from personal experience because you're like, I could tell you 35 ways to get it wrong. <laughs> Here's what might work. <laughs> Okay, so you have some personal non-negotiables that you mention in your book, and I wanted to kind of get into uh, the mindset behind some of these. One of them, or a few of them, I'll mention a few. Do not swear, never hit snooze, write for 90 minutes a day, meditate for 10 minutes a day, and you have a few others on there as well. Actually, personally, just curious about the do not swear non-negotiable. I'm curious about what the intention was from the get-go. Why was that a desire of yours? Where did that come from? And then how long has it been and have you noticed any noticeable positive impact in your life from not swearing? Uh, there's some, there's been some weird side effects of it uh, <laughs> okay. that I'll mention in a minute. Um, but I'm not sure. Like I remember I said dang like two minutes ago. I was like, I wonder how many people are going to pick up on the fact that I said dang on a, on a podcast. They're like, who is this old guy? Anyways, um, so I have nothing against swearing. I'm yeah. swearing in my head all the time. <laughs> That's awesome. In, 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 in 2011... <laughs> Uh, so long, long time ago, I was working out and some of the thoughts that were going through my head were, you know, you, hey, Craig, you run this um, website where you tell people what to do all the time. So we have this business called Early to Rise and it's, I bought it off a mentor of mine. So it's been around for 22 years now and it just gives, you know, life advice and business advice and that sort of stuff. So, mm -hmm. so here I am every day, I tell people what to do. And I don't know why it came up in my mind, but I was just like, but you know, you swear a lot. Um, so maybe you could quit swearing that, that was it. Like okay. there was no, there was no other thing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to quit swearing because I also knew these two facts that I never swore when I spoke on stage. Like, I just don't get these men and women who are dropping F bombs on stage. Like I, I do understand that a you can get a lot of belly laughs from a well-timed F bomb, mm -hmm. but if you drop 25 F bombs in a presentation, it totally ruins it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be wrong, right? So I was like, okay, but I never spoke, I never swore on stage, and I had never, ever, and still never have sworn in front of my mother. And I thought, you know what? I have control over what comes out of my mouth, mm -hmm. I, clearly, because I don't swear there and I don't swear there, but I swear all these other times just because, you know, there's, I don't have any rules. So I decided that day that I would quit swearing. And at the time, I had an email list of 151,000 people in the fitness space because that was where I started out in my business. Mm -hmm. And I just told them, I'm, I'm going to stop swearing. So uh, the first day, I swore six times. The second day, I swore four times. The uh, third day, I swore two times. And then I stopped swearing. And unless I see a giant bug, which there are a lot of in Cancun, yeah. um, I, I don't swear. So giant bugs and in my bathroom. The, I might come swear. out. Yeah. So... <laughs> so so I just quit swearing. Now, that just was a was proof to me um, that you know you can kind of put your mindset to do anything. And and it was funny. Like I was I was for the longest time I was using the word sugar shack like mm -hmm. to replace swear words. So sugar you know, shack. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that word. But so so what are the what are the lessons here? Yeah. One that you can do a lot of great things. Two, uh, what really helped me was I used a model. So. I have a friend who's um, who lives in England, and I and he's a little bit older than me, and I just he is just absolutely. Like, when you think of a polite, courteous British gentleman, mm -hmm. he's a polite, courteous British gentleman. And so I decided I wanted to be a polite, courteous British gentleman. Like that's one of my things. And so you know, and that's obviously holding the door for people and opening it and saying hello. And and I also like like I've taken it to the not to the extreme, but to the point where I don't look at my phone in an elevator. So when somebody comes in, I actually say hi to them because that's what a polite and courteous British mm -hmm. gentleman would do. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't swear. So I had this model. And, you know, if you if you want to improve your fitness or you want to become a great female entrepreneur, you, you know, you, you pick Emily as your model. And you go, okay, well, what would Emily do in this situation? How would she react? And how would she respond? So you kind of play that game. Mm -hmm. And so I had that. And then also... You know, for me, punishments work well. So it's mm -hmm. like if I swore, then it was twenty dollars. Um, you know, some people, a lot actually. I have a lot of clients who have 
used websites or just you know made this declaration that you know they're going to put money if they do something they're going to give money to you know a cause not a cause but like a political party they don't like or oh that's funny you can (laughs) you can do that yeah (laughs) i I remember one time um and i hope i don't offend anybody with this but one time one of my i woke up one morning and i after my work i checked my email and says here's your receipt for sending 500 dollars to bernie sanders and i was like (laughs) what happened? <laughs> like, did somebody get into my PayPal? But right. it wasn't my PayPal. It was one of my clients who said, if I ever hit the snooze button, I'm going to send $500 to Bernie. And they were just, and I'd forgotten that they said that. And they were just showing me that, man, they had slept in and they were like, never again. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's, create, create the consequence as painful as possible yeah. so that it There's, nips it in the butt. Yeah. So some people are carrot people. Some people are like stick people, right? The carrot, the reward, the stick, the punishment. So you can use that. And that, but really, the power is in public accountability. So whenever I see somebody, like I was talking about, there's like some weird side effects. People freak out when they swear in front of me. They're like, "Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry," and mm. I'm like, "I really don't care," right. because again, I'm not. I didn't. I didn't. I, I, I mean, I think it's good to not swear a lot, mm. but I didn't do it for that particular reason. Like mm. that, I think that if you say the S word, you're gonna burned in the h word right 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 right. i don't think that but um other people whenever they're around me and they have read the book or read any of my articles about it or seem like i've got youtube videos on how i quit swearing and they they get really like scared like i'm gonna punish them because they swore in front of me so so that's been funny and then the other thing is that nobody has ever said to me um that hasn't read the book and or anything nobody has ever said to me Hey, I notice you don't swear. Interesting. So it's fascinating. I thought, you know, when I started dating um, Michelle, my wife, mm-hmm. my soon-to-be wife, uh, or when she wasn't my wife, um, mm-hmm. I thought she's going to be like, wow, you don't swear. Not, Not once. once. <laughs> That's no, awesome. No, nobody's ever noticed that I don't swear. Fascinating. And so that just goes to show you and, you know, hopefully um, you can convince your children of this, that you don't have to swear to be cool and have mm. friends because nobody has ever said to me, you know, you'd be a lot, you'd be a lot more fun if you just drop some F-bombs. Nobody's ever said it. It's that's so true. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. so good. And I think it's very applicable for people who want to quit any habit, right? There's a lot of vices, as you call them in the book that are just not helpful if you're looking to be the most excellent version of yourself. And I think it's up to each individual to identify what that is for them and then take massive action to actually create change in that area of their life. Before we end here, because I want to respect your time, we're coming up on 45 minutes here. Is there anything else that we didn't cover from the book that you would like to share or maybe one last piece of advice for those people that are seeking to create change in their life when it comes to their energy management and uh, yeah, just one last piece of advice that you feel like you could offer them. I think one thing that is very simple, but every time I kind of make a video on it, um, people really go like, whoa, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. And, and it's um, recently a friend of mine, uh, one of my coaching clients said, you know, like, what are your cornerstone habits that have helped you be successful over the years? And most people will think like, oh, you know, Craig's written this book on morning routines and all this stuff and getting up early. And it's like, that's important. But it's actually your bedtime that is so important because if you don't nail the bedtime, then it's harder to not hit snooze. It's harder to get up with energy. It's harder to stick to the plan that you want to keep. And I, you know, for years and years and years and years and years, I was, you know, when I was younger and going to bed later, it'd be like 11 o'clock. I want to go to bed at 11 o'clock tonight. Especially when I was a personal trainer and, you know, I had to get up super early in the morning, Mm -hmm. be like 11 o'clock. And then you look at the clock and it's like 1130. And then you go like tomorrow night, I'm going to go to bed at like nine o'clock. But then tomorrow night, it's 1130. And it's like because there, there's so many temptations at night. And, you know, that was before Netflix and all that stuff. Now, today, it's insane. Mm-hmm. So the tip that I recommend to everybody that a lot of people haven't heard before is what's called a reverse alarm. And a reverse alarm is simply an alarm on your phone that goes off an hour before bed. Everybody knows they have an alarm in the morning, Mm -hmm. but nobody really, hardly anybody ever thinks having an alarm to remind you to get to bed on time. And so what we teach people in our books and programs and stuff is if you want to go to bed 10 o'clock at night, have an alarm that goes off on your phone at 9 o'clock at night. At 9 o'clock at night, 
that alarm means you turn off all your electronics, right? Because research shows that the blue light emitted from your mm -hmm. electronics, you know, keeps you up. And it's always like the last message you get and check at night that just like infuriates <laughs> Every you. Every time. Facebook, right? It's always that last message. Just let it sit there overnight um, when it won't matter. And <laughs> So uh, and then you do what I call old school activities. You read a book, you take a bath, you do mm. your meditation, you make your lunch, you, you make your lunches for your kids, you, like you read to your kids, you talk to your spouse with no phones, like you do all these things that, you know, we would have done, I would have done, sorry, I would have done, my parents would have done in the 1990s when I was growing up, mm -hmm. when we didn't have all of these things, you know, so aside from the television, we didn't have all these things that would keep us up at night. And so now you actually can get to bed on time mm. because if you get to bed on time, you'll generally get as much sleep as you're hoping to provided, you know, you sleep well enough and you don't, you know, you didn't have an espresso three hours before bed. And now you can get up on time. Mm -hmm. You can have the, your best energy for your hardest task. You can have a great workout. You won't, you know, want to go to Starbucks and get a Frappuccino because you're tired and cranky. Like, it's it's that I don't know if you ever seen like the the little domino the tiny little domino mm -hmm. that oh, six dominoes later it knocks down a door. That's right? insane. And, and I really that's actually I'll go back one more step. The reverse alarm is the second domino because the first domino is planning and preparing the night the day before mm -hmm. for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So most a lot of people do their to do list in the morning. If you're doing your to do list in the morning, you're already too late. Your to do list needs to be done the day before so that you. You wake up the next morning, and when you have the greatest discipline, willpower, and intention, you're able to execute on the first thing on the to-do list. Mm -hmm. But if you're using that greatest discipline, willpower, and intention just to figure out what the heck you're going to do today, uh, you've already lost 10, 20, 30 minutes of the most important time. So what you do today determines tomorrow, and it's so important. And that's the kind of like the planning and preparation mm -hmm. is the genius in almost anything. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And for everyone listening, where can they grab the perfect week formula? Yeah. So Amazon mm -hmm. um, for a physical copy or perfectweekformula.com for a physical copy. But I also give out all my books for free, like no opt-in required, you know, nothing. Just go to craigvalentine.com forward slash free books and you can download the eBooks and you can download the audio books. So if you want a physical copy, obviously you have to pay a little bit of money um, on Amazon. But if you want just the digital versions, craigvalentine.com forward slash free books. And the reason I do that is because I wrote my books to be read. And so I want to eliminate all friction uh, getting in the way of somebody reading my books. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a bookworm. Books meant a lot to me as a kid. And I want to help people out. That's incredible. And for everyone listening, I'll have the links down below. And I can tell you this link and this book will literally change your life. And it will give you more freedom and time for the things that really matter in your life, like your family, relationships, loved ones, while being successful and being the most excellent version of yourself. So Craig, thank you so much for being on today's show. Listeners, you know the drill. If you enjoyed today's show, please do us a favor. Tag your friends, share on Instagram stories. Feel free to tag both Craig and myself. Let us know what was impactful for you. And without further ado, we'll see you guys in the next episode of Evolve with Emily. Bye, everyone.